I suppose what's really rewarding is, is that here today we've got the two major political parties, the present government, coalition government and the Labour Party talking about skills and vocational education and training. I think if we went back to 97 with the advent of the Labour government, Connor was around at that time, that the, lay, the education, education, education from Tony Blair, um, which was absolutely right, I, I don't think any of that really was vocational education and training. And I met with David Blunkett as part of the commission that I chaired, and David said his regret, one of his regrets was at that time that he couldn't get the whole vocation, education and training agenda high enough up the, the, the government's agenda. And I think in recent years, we, we, are, we, we weren't having many conferences like this even three years ago where people were coming together to talk about the, uh, the, the future of vocation, education and training. So that's fantastic. And we get a much clearer sight of what a good apprenticeship programme looks like and we just had an extraordinary example there from Andrea about um, top-class apprenticeship programme and how it works. The truth is that despite all of our efforts, in London this year, less than 4% of young people are on apprenticeship programmes. Um, and overall, it's still a minority route. Now, clearly, we would like it to be a majority route in this country, but that's a whole other discussion. So the, the, the commission that I chaired was looking at, if you like, the third way, the vocational route to success. So route one described very clearly GCSE, A-levels. Route two, if you like, the work-based apprenticeship route. But the biggest route um, is the vocational route, those young people and adult students following vocational programs. And a number of people have mentioned pipeline today. And in the background of, of the commission that I um, chaired was about how we build a homegrown pipeline of those high-skilled individuals that we'll need at the technician level, not at level six, at level four, five, HNC, HND for the future. What was great about the, this commission was, you know, I've been for more than 30 years now in further education, was we had Lorna Unwin from the Institute of Edu Education as our academic advisor. You know, we often begin these, everyone had a view, I had a view, everyone had a view on what the outcomes of this commission should be. What Lorna's wise counsel was, let's not begin with the end in sight. Let, let's, let's let, let that emerge. Let's learn from practice to theory. So we went on a, a number of important um, visits. I won't read them all out. You can see some of them there. And in the course of the Commission's work, which was a, a little under a year, we had more than 300 submissions of evidence as to what outstanding vocational teaching and learning should look like. Um, and you can see there, they're everything from BA systems to a farm in, uh, in, in uh, Somerset, Rolls-Royce, um, the Army, um, some very small training providers. Mm. And what the, the Commission came back, the, the key kind of propositions from the Commission are simple, but I think very profound as to what good or outstanding vocational education training looks like. The key bit is the language. So actually, John and others used the term VET in their presentations earlier. People all over the world use the term VET, vocational education and training. I was warned off of using VET. We don't like VET. But VET is the international language, and it seems to me VET is exactly the right language to describe. So this, this tells you, in our view on the Commission, what good or outstanding vocational education training looks like. And by default, it tells you what isn't vocational education and training. And one of the issues I'd be up for debate on this is, a lot of the work in school that was dis schools described as being vocational provision is not vocational provision. It doesn't mean it's good, bad, or indifferent, it's sim and, and colleges. It simply is, so by these four criteria, it's not vocational. So the, the, the title of the report was, it's about work. I recently found, um, there's a lot of back to the future here today about things in the past. Um, it was the 21st anniversary of my college this year, and we've written a history of the college, and I found a launch of one of the predecessor organisations, City College Bunhill Row, 1964. We had great good fortune from City College Bunhill Row. We sold the site for £23 million to a bank in 1999 in the City of London. But City College Bunhill Row in 1964 was only about work. It was, as Andrea described, young people coming to the college on day or block release from their employers um, following apprenticeship programmes or training programmes. There was nothing else. So keep that in mind. So four characteristics. A clear line of sight to work. 
you have to be able to see work. You're either in work or you can see the work placement. So just up the road here, Westminster Kingsway's catering department, full international standard catering. They're not in work, they're students, but they've got line of sight to work. My own college, we train opticians, dispensing opticians. They're not in work, but we have dispensing surgeries in the college where they can practice their trade. Dual professional teachers and trainers. Critical one for me. You've got to have come from the industry and be going back and forward to the industry. There's a big challenge in that. Thirdly, access to industry standard facilities and equipment. Why did, we've spoken here about big employers, why historically did small employers come to colleges? Because colleges had kit that they didn't have. And they came to see the latest equipment and work with that inside the organisations. And finally, and critically for me, escalators to higher level vocational learning and um, higher levels of study. So for me, vocational educational training, whatever level it starts at, must end at, for me, a terminal qualification at level four or five in the debate we've had today, HNC, HND, technicians, paraprofessionals, supervisory level staff. Doesn't mean they can't articulate and go on to do the degree programme, but that, for me, is where higher vocational programmes could be. I think one of the disruptive impacts of mass higher education in this country in recent years is that we've got people going to a level six qualification to work back at a level four or five role at best sometimes. And we need to develop shorter, clearer routes to technician level education. Two year HNC, HND foundation degree programs. Some, some of the ways we do this. The critical thing, we've said it all day today, is the employer. What we've managed to develop in our system is vocational qualifications which could be delivered with no reference to the workplace at all. In fact, we've developed a national vertical system. Qualifications are national and vertical. Money drops down national vertical slots. Ofsted is a national vertical system, and so on. So I remember the point when employers said, where's the place for us in this? Well, what we have to do is put the employer right back in the heart of the, of the qualifications for our full-time students, not those students who are just at work. And there's a, a myriad ways to do that. Um, a, a development called Teach2. Um, we're having some real success in my own college on that now, getting people in. So somebody mentioned rurally, we're getting small businesses to come in and deliver accountancy units in our business programmes. So you, don't, so you can think of wherever you are, you've got businesses that operate who would come in and help you to deliver certainly something like business study. Qualifications, Nigel Whitehead from BAE Systems led a review of that to give us more flexibly, flexibility locally so that they're not just all dropping down national vertical slots. It's a big demand on leadership and management. It's a big issue in our sector now. You can't be a successful senior manager in the FE system by just looking internally. You've got to both look internally at the quality of your provision, the support for your students, but you have to build bridges with, with, with outside. And finally, for another day, what's the best way to break down this national system? I'm completely convinced that we must do that. So money must be delivered differently so that colleges and training providers in a broader system, and I like the, the term from Andrew, it's a system rather than a sector, so that we work more locally with employers in a systemic way to deliver the needs of, of the locality. Um, right, I'll, Chris, give me the nod, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Thank you.